Hello friends, for many months now I've been holding back on creating a video like this, publicly denouncing Jason Unruh, until I had a larger audience. As my sub count is on the fast track towards 1000, I thought it was finally time. I was not always the kind of Marxist I am today, I too was once a bright-eyed young leftist who had recently joined the community. Like many newcomers, I followed Jason Unruh and was tightly woven into the Unruh cult believing whatever he produced to be the truth. Today I stand in opposition to Jason Unruh, on the opposite side of the room, dismissing, disagreeing, and disassociating him from the left. Why is that? This video will aim to provide reasons for why you should never take Jason Unruh seriously ever again. Jason Unruh has repeatedly shown he has very twisted and incorrect views on dialectics. Let us begin with Jason's so-called Third Worldism. One of the pillars of Third Worldism is that the First World working class has supposedly lost its ability to engage in revolution because it has been bought off by the imperialist bourgeoisie. We're going to assume that this is done unconsciously, through high standards of living and a greater expansion of political freedoms than many find in the Third World. Third Worldists actually deny the existence of a First World proletariat. They believe the class struggle has been supposedly wiped away by high standards of living and outsourcing. And as a result, the First World proletariat has been supplemented with a global labor aristocracy. This means they have lost their class interest for revolution and would now side with the imperialist bourgeoisie. This is not only a misunderstanding of dialectics, but an outright rejection of dialectics. This is a purely analytical perspective, not a dialectical perspective. From this perspective, class is based on living standards, income level, and other arbitrary measurements. This purely analytical perspective is not suited for understanding the antagonistic dialectical relationship between the owners of capital and all their employees. Through materialist dialectics, we understand that class is based on one's relation to capital, and that those who work under capital will always have interests at odds with those who own capital. So long as classes exist, there is class struggle. Adopting the analytical perspective is a clear rejection of Marxist dialectics. Another pillar of Third Worldism is its historical analysis. Third Worldists, especially Jason, hold that the First World has never had base areas, and that all revolutionary struggles, since the development of the imperialist and imperialized worlds, have come from the poorest regions on earth. They say this is specifically because the proletariat of these countries are worked in slavish conditions, and once crisis strikes, have no choice but to rebel. However, this notion that poverty and crisis are the determinant factors for revolutionary situations comes from an analytical outlook, and not a dialectical outlook. It is the most surface level of observations, and does not take into account the whole picture of a revolutionary situation. In Russia, for example, Stalin was very clear, in the foundations of Leninism, that a revolution came to Russia chiefly because it was on the eve of a bourgeois revolution, not because of the rampant poverty, not because of the First World War, but because the Russian bourgeoisie was on the eve of their bourgeois revolution, and indeed did carry out that bourgeois revolution in February. China's conditions for revolution were twofold. First, similar to Russia, China had recently experienced her bourgeois revolution. Secondly, China was engaged in a national liberation struggle, which was principally led by the communists. The current revolutionary conflicts in the world find their heart not simply in the level of poverty of the, in the country or area, but in anti-imperialist and national liberation struggles like India and the Philippines. The Communist Party of the Philippines began its struggle as an anti-imperialist struggle against U.S. hegemony and its politics. The Naxalites began as an indigenous rebellion, that meaning a struggle for self-determination. So yes, while revolutions have only historically happened in poor countries, it's not chiefly because they are poor, and not because class antagonisms are intensified there. This all exemplifies the lack of dialectical perspective in the Third Worldist narrative. Lastly, in June of this year, 
Tovarish in Diamon made a critique of third worldism in which he presents the following quote straight from the hand of Mao Zedong himself. Internally, capitalist countries practice bourgeois democracy, not feudalism, when they are not fascist and not at war in their external relations. They are not oppressed by, but themselves oppress other nations. Because of these characteristics, it is the task of the party of the proletariat in capitalist countries to educate the workers and build up strength through a long period of legal struggle, and thus prepare for the final overthrow of capitalism. In these countries, the question is one of a long legal struggle of utilizing parliament as a platform, of economic and political strikes, of organizing trade unions and educating the workers. There, the form of organization is legal, and the form of struggle is bloodless, non-military. On the issue of war, the communist parties in the capitalist countries oppose imperialist wars waged by their own countries. If such wars occur, the policy of these parties is to bring about the defeat of the reactionary governments in their own countries. The one war they want to fight is the civil war for which they are preparing. And how does Jason Unruh, owner and sole proprietor of Maoist Rebel News, respond? And as for this idea of a legal war that turns into uh, a revolution, that's laughable. Is that what first worldists or people in the advanced capitalist countries have been doing for a hundred years? No, actually, they've not. They've been doing Euro-communism for a hundred years. This thing that you've invented by a legal war turning into a revolution is a complete fiction. You've just made that up. Yikes. Just made it up, did he? Now we move on to Jason Unruh's defeatism. What is defeatism, and how is he a defeatist? Put simply, defeatism is the acceptance of defeat without struggle. How is he defeatist? Let us listen in on another clip from Unruh. To put it, uh, to, to put it in the, the simplest terms possible, the first world is not revolutionary because of its exploitation of the third world that buys a better living standard for its people. Thus, it is up to the third world to release itself from the shackles of the, of the first world. Jason, by extension of living in the first world, is one of the greatest defeatists of our time, if not the greatest. He has done nothing to aid the conditions of the third world proletariat or to aid revolutionary organizations in the third world. Because of his beliefs, he becomes worthless to himself. No action he could possibly do would amount to anything. To him, there is no amount of action which can spark a revolution in the first world. At best, he believes we need to sit tight for a catastrophic crisis to hit, then begin action. Regardless, it is clear Unruh is defeatist, and as such we cannot expect him to act, nor can we condone those who tail behind him. Defeatism is a cancer among the left, a disease which must be eradicated. To engage in defeatism is to deny the point of struggle, that is, struggle in the abstract, whether political, legal, economist, or revolutionary, it matters not, as the defeatist views them all doomed without chance. As such, defeatists like Unruh see no reason to engage in the first place. Third of all, we must criticize Jason's transphobia. You all knew this one was coming, I've spent a lot of time on this platform defending Marxist intersectionality, and the trans community as a whole. So of course, this was going to be part of my anti unru video. If you'd like to see a detailed explanation, I'm going to shamelessly plug my friend Austrian Maoist One's video, where he goes through Jason Unruh's transphobia. What you need to know as a baseline is that, for years, for years, Jason has consistently and deliberately attacked the trans community as liberal identity politics, misgendered people time after time again, and insinuated that the existence of trans people makes other people's lives more difficult. A concrete example of this is his behavior towards Anarchopac. Repeatedly, he openly attacked Zoe's existence as a trans person. I will now let part of her video play. Since making this video, Maoist Rebel News has made his position on trans people clear by repeatedly and deliberately misgendering me. When I identified as agender, 
he wrote on Twitter in September 2017 that I'm, quote, a white, upper-middle-class male without actual oppression, leeching off the third world, pretending not to. Watching the anarcho pack pity party is pretty stellar. When you call him out on his class privilege, he actually thinks his personal problems are the basis for class oppression. That's the postmodernist disease for you. His childhood sucked, assuming I believe him, so therefore the global class divide in wealth doesn't exist, or that he and all the other first world people live off third world exploitation. Wait until you have to actually get a job and live like an adult. On Facebook, he repeated these claims and said that I have, quote, the special snowflake victim complex, which first worldists have. In January 2018, I came out on YouTube as a trans woman. Upon being linked to my video on how I've been suicidal since I was 11, which was made after I came out, Jason responded by saying, quote, I don't respect his right to live. Why would I respect any other aspect about him? In February, he wrote on Facebook that, quote, I just watched a narco pack attacking Finbol video, typical anarchist tripe. The video basically says that authoritarianism is wrong because of freedom. He, like them, makes the argument against authoritarianism by offering what doesn't work, has never worked, will never work. There's nothing new here. This is why he refuses to debate me. He's scared. Jason Anru has, for years, railed against so-called identity politics, not understanding that identity politics is an immense umbrella which encompasses white nationalist identitarianism, Marxist intersectionality, and everything in between. An identity struggle, for example, a national liberation struggle, can be essential to the class struggle. Huey P. Newton describes the black working class as facing a wholly unique form of oppression in the United States, one which crosses the oppression of the working class with the oppression of African Americans. The wage gap, something which has been reported on and understood by economists since women entered the workplace is the literal, material manifestation of the intersection between worker oppression and female oppression. These groups, often marginalized, experience both class oppression and identity oppression, leading to certain struggles which we simply cannot understand unless we are to experience those same struggles. But Jason Unruh, in his ignorance, believes that identity politics can only drag down the Marxist movement. This means either one of two things. One, that Jason Unruh believes the intersection between identity struggles and class struggles doesn't exist, and that things such as the popular women's movement and the Black Panther Party are vulgarizations, and that their struggles have hindered the development of the revolutionary movement. Or two, that Jason is blissfully ignorant of what identity politics means, and has decided to go on a six-year-long campaign against something he never chose to look into deeper than what you'd find in an anti-SJW cringe compilation. My vote is towards the second option, truthfully, but I hope I've shown how ignorant he really is. Jason Unruh, you do not understand dialectics. You are a defeatist of the highest degree. You are transphobic. You do not understand identity politics. You do not deserve the platform you have. Thank you. I'd like to thank Comrade Jameson for helping me write my script, and I'd like to thank my patrons. Anderson Hansen, Antivirus Perspective, Austria Maoist One, Calliope, Comrade Dodo, Fabian Freiburg, John Alexander Michael Bernstein, Jonathan Chavez, Joko, Kimo Vasala, Marcel Schachner, Mausov, Piggy, Sienna Sidel Beard, CAM, William Scott, and Wild. If you'd like to support me on Patreon, it would be greatly appreciated, as it is currently my primary form of income. Also, there is still time to enter into the server 
to place a food item for the Patreon cooking stream. Thank you all. Have a good day.